Greetings and boo, my viewers. It is the Halloween and it is scary outside. Boo! What the fuck are you doing? Eek! A demon! Take that, blasphemer! Anyway, I'm finally back. Hopefully by October. If not, I will kill. I was aiming for Halloween, but life just kept getting in the way. It's been quite a hellish year on my end, though. Obviously, first world problems. At least for now. I don't want to talk about any of it. I just want to talk about the tunes. Since it's Halloween, as you know, I do have a single video for a specific album I recorded back in April, and I've since uploaded it. But I've also wanted to make something else in the meantime. A video I've wanted to make since I conceptualized this channel while stuck in retail. Also, just to note, I got my wisdom teeth pulled and the anesthesia had a bad reaction, so not only do I sound groggy, I'm also in a lot of pain, and a lot of this recording will probably be... slower. To start, all forms of art in some way are treated differently. Every snob thinks their preferred medium isn't taken seriously enough. In the case of music, the same problems persist. You have channels that focus on music to talk about celebrities or celebrity fodder. However, for music, even the really respected classical genre, the main issue I've always seen is music as education, where music is used to teach the construction of music itself and little else. Whether it be time signatures, keys, or Italian lingo, the problem just resonates where people try to distance themselves from the music itself. There's this video I watched years ago about videotape by Radiohead where they explain the mechanisms and how it helps the song, which I'm sure helps, but the song itself is still about a suicide tape. Isn't there more to say than just how it's composed? Syncopation happens when you accent those notes outside of the beat, on those ands. And that is exactly what Tom York is doing with his piano, to pull off this illusion. That piano should happen on beat one, but it doesn't. Speaking of Radiohead, do you remember that project done where math was used to determine the sadness of a song? It was mostly done for fun with somebody who liked math and possibly had a degree, but I've noticed a few fucks use it like it's some kind of measurement. Not gonna say their name, but Liam has the top shit. It seems people find their opinions on something really nagging because it's a part of them, and if somebody tells you to kill yourself because you hate Weezer, what do you do? <clears throat> when it comes to taking art seriously, it's not just about treating it like a product. You know, what does it mean to you? How is it influenced by the world around and around you? I get people are self-conscious, but I don't think treating music like a template will fix that. Why would Radiohead make a song about a suicide tape where the last line implies the person was the happiest they've ever been? It has an ugly real-life connotation, and that's the point. Most of the videos on a song will focus on celebrity fodder and history behind it without saying much. On another note, there's a tiny bit of chatter about the term disturbing, because people associate the disturbing with the external context of a song. Although the idea of dark and disturbing music is, uh, well, it's filled with the brim with low effort content by creators grifting at low expectations rather than the actual music or lyrics contained within. Which only proves my point that people focus too much on context and not text. There's a lot to dig into when you ditch the shock and awe of the disturbing descriptor and embrace something like unnerving. And it's easy to see how a simple descriptor change can heavily affect the way we look at things. Disturbing is just a description people use to describe the grisly nature of something from our perspective. Using unsettling only makes it seem like mild discomfort. Unsettled is how I feel when a snake poops. Because in general, people treat art that aims to disturb and provoke a little differently to more accessible art, which also plays into the popular equals good fallacy. The point of disturbing art isn't just to provoke or be edgy. It's to make people question the life they live contrasted with the life of others. The luxury you have versus the horror somebody else sees it as. That doesn't mean all provocative art is meant to only be shocking either. Sometimes a person sees the world in a different way, and we shouldn't reward a person for conforming to what people expect. Plus, judging art by its backstory can and does help, but at the same time, the art is not the backstory. Lastly, I want to discuss accessibility. There's a video about the genre of grimdark by OSP Red, full name Ravioli, and towards the end she touches on accessibility for more grotesque genres. 
specifically citing the way grief counselors or trauma therapists will return home to escape from their horrorish life. It is interesting to note, by the way, that both perspective and catharsis by proxy only work if they're a form of negative escapism. People who actually deal with very upsetting stuff on a daily basis, like grief counselors, people struggling with personal trauma, etc., often actively avoid all things grimdark and favor much more lighthearted, optimistic media. And I get that. I understand perfectly that some people live hard lives and don't want to go home to experience more of that. Some people have horrid lives in this shitty world. When my mom was dying before she died, I avoided a lot more videos and mostly plastered myself in escapism. I couldn't handle the constant stress of helping out to take care of her. Even after, when life continued to be at rank 11 at all times, I'd find myself just re-watching stuff that makes me laugh and forget. However, the straw man she was rebuting was people explaining they like the genre because seeing somebody having it harder helps them both, one, appreciate the life they have and the struggle they face, and two, allows them to face a sort of catharsis to recover from that hardship. She mostly ignores this point to preach about how people have it harder and you should pull up your pants and find Jesus. Are you sad? Be mad and do yoga about it. Just don't have it. Fuck it. This is a terrible counterpoint, especially because it also disregards that these were real points people were making to her when she asked for it. Like, for fuck's sake. I'm sure many do in the same breath. I'm sure many don't. Everyone is different. I grew up in a broken household. Even then, I still watch a lot of disturbing art because that connection feels better. To know that somebody else faces a similar struggle feels a lot better than watching somebody who has it better than me. That is not me dismissing her point about how real people don't want to live their real lives. I get why people have escapism. My point is not that she's wrong, more that her point seems to disregard the other point of the narrative. Disturbing art, whether mild or wild, aims to disrupt a comfort in a person. Comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable, as said by Caesar A. Cruz, or whoever he took it from but died before they could say it first, is a common mantra in these spaces. It's easy to say, but a lot of people who really look away from trouble are over wealthy and isolated. They don't have to look at any real problems until it's in their face, so they choose to blank it out. Some people just don't live lives where they know these things are happening, even with the internet. Everyone consumes art differently. I'm not bashing people who prefer warnings for what they will watch, by the way. Different strokes for different folks. What frustrates me to no end is the complete dismissiveness of inaccessible art in favor of accessible art under the guise of some moral quandary. For me, music that instills horror, discomfort, shock, and even dread helps me process my own uncomfortable emotions. Sometimes I do choose to watch complete nonsense to cheer myself up or numb away the pain, but that's when I choose to. And sometimes I choose to indulge in something that may truly leave me awake at night. Disturbing music is as real of an art form to main music. The purpose of it is also to be an awakening. As the quote says, the people who deserve comfort should receive it, and the people who have it should be reminded of who doesn't. Final note. My issue comes a lot from people associating music with parties and background ambience. Again, everyone does whatever with everything. More that the most popular music is orchestra, club, and ambient because they exist to feel a utility. The consequence is that most people associate music with pop music or background music, little else even if unsettling music is really common. You're telling me one of the most popular albums of all time isn't about living in a world you don't understand? Because it's also about how the mainstream perceive music as a tool or as content. And keep in mind, I'm referring to myself too. I never knew music could even create feelings like eeriness or dread until about 2019 because most of my friends only listened to pop rap, and the ones that didn't listened to nerdcore, I guess. People treat music more as entertainment because that's how we treat it in our day to day. To start listening to music outside of that bubble is to take it seriously, which can also help with taking pop music seriously even more. Mostly, I want discussion of music to be about music.